Hello everyone and welcome to Archaeolite Me. Today is the seventh video in my series on the earliest large-scale conflicts between Native American nations and European colonial powers. <laughs> uh, it is also the tenth video in my series on early colonial debacles that disprove the myth of inherent European superiority. The subject of today's video are the horse lords known as the Comanche. Specifically, the subject of this video is their defeat of the Spanish Empire in the American Southwest and the rise of Comanche dominance of the Southern Great Plains. Now, as always, whenever I bring up terms for uh, geographic regions or countries, uh, such as, say, the American Southwest, the United States, China, etc. I always like to point out that whenever in our modern minds we hear these terms, we think of these regions, countries, uh, geographic areas, etc. Uh, as they are now in the modern world. Uh, for example, the American Southwest, we might think of it you know, in a few different ways. There, if people define it in a few different ways, but we might think of it in our modern minds as the region containing uh, the states of California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Arizona, or New Mexico, or um, conversely, we might think of it, it push it a little bit further uh, east and only include, can you think of it as a region that includes uh, states like Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, or Oklahoma. Uh, and of course, us thinking of this in our modern minds, it, it, the way it is now in the modern world, is not necessarily wrong. It's it's an incredibly perfectly valid way of thinking. But of course, the Southwest, at least uh, in terms uh, politically and um, you know in terms of uh, the borders and geography of it, um, the geopolitical geography of it, not the environmental geography of it, did not always look this way. Uh, it only became the shape that you see here on these maps after a long series of events and processes. So in order to get a better picture on how uh, the American Southwest became what it is, we need to go back a little further in time to get a better look at the bigger picture. Okay, so this leads us to our first section the Comanche and related Native American cultures before and up to early European contact. So uh, before European contact and even during, uh, the Comanche and many other related Native groups resided in an area of the, of, of the modern United States, an area of New Mexico known as the Great Basin. Um, that could extend anywhere between, depending on your definition of it, uh, from all the way up into Canada, uh, as well as all the way down into Colorado. But generally, most people, when they think of the Great Basin, they think of the area that, the geographic area that constitutes uh, most of Utah, Nevada, um, and uh, so the southernmost half of Idaho, the southeastern part of Oregon, uh, the westernmost parts of Wyoming and Colorado, uh, small parts of Arizona and New Mexico, and then also small parts of California. And the tribes during this in this region, uh, during and before, uh, during and up to European contact, uh, generally lived in um, dwellings sort of like this. Uh, teepees and various other types of tents made out of uh, generally deer or buffalo hide. And these cultures were hunter-gatherer nomadic cultures subsisting on uh, food items such as rabbits, which they would hunt for food as well as for uh, pelts to make clothing out of, as you see here. Uh, of course, they would hunt deer for, again, for food and clothing items. They would also hunt small rodents, 
uh, as well as uh, birds, uh, specifically types of waterfowl such as ducks, as evidenced by essentially dummy ducks found in archaeology that were probably used uh, to draw ducks in to make them easier to hunt. And we can see examples of the types of animals that the cultures of the Great Basin would hunt and utilize uh, in archaeological remains uh, from uh, archaeological sites such as the Tucker site. And you can see here generally the makeup of uh, the amount and types and such of animals utilized at the Tucker site in the Great Basin. Uh, the cultures of the Great Basin would also um, use horticulture uh, to gather uh, and utilize different kinds of uh, plants indigenous to the area, such as amaranth uh, and saltbrush, as well as shad scale and seaweed. And these would be used uh, for a variety of uses, uh, some being used for initial use, of course, some being used for food use, uh, some being used to make clothes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and you can see that all here in this graph. Uh, however, um, the Comanche and their related groups, the Shoshone and the Utes, did not begin to show up, uh, did, not, did, not, uh, did not reside in the Great Basin um, until around the 1400s uh, and 1500s. Uh, they began to migrate into the Wyoming uh, in Idaho and other parts of the Great Basin around, uh, most archaeologists think, roughly around uh, the 16th century. So around the 1500s, maybe the 1400s at the earliest. Um, and this is the migration of the Shoshonean-speaking groups, specifically the, Com the Comanche and their relatives, the Shoshone. And this can be this migration during this period of time can be tracked by uh, the appearance of very distinctive uh, types of pottery known as intramountain ware during this period of time, as well as very distinctive and new types of projectile points. Uh, and you can see these here. So these are Shoshonean style arrow points, uh, and these are. Uh, intra mountain wear vessels. And then, as you can see in this paper, they were used uh, rather effectively uh, to trace the movements of Shoshonean speaking peoples uh, and their migrations throughout the archaeological record, uh, showing that they did indeed um, only uh, did indeed only show up into the Great Basin around the 1400s and 1500s CE. Uh, it also was able to be used to show the presence of Proto-Ute uh, or Ute peoples uh, in the area as well, who also began to migrate into this region uh, a little bit earlier around the 1300s CE. Uh, and here is a map of the distribution of Shoshonean, Ute, and Comanche sites in the Great Basin. Uh, of course, um, the cultures of the Great Basin and as well as the Great Plains uh, began to evolve uh, in a very large ways with the coming of Spanish colonization as well as the reintroduction of horses into North America. So in the 1540s through the 1590s, uh, well into 1600, uh, the Spanish Empire began to make inroads into what is now the North American Southwest, uh, New Mexico, uh, Texas, Arizona, California, etc., uh, and eventually uh, completely, quote-unquote, uh, conquered it and colonized it uh, by uh, 1600, though, of course, they suffered many setbacks, uh, specifically in the Great Pueblo Revolt, which saw the retaking of New Mexico by the Pueblo people uh, for 12 years, uh, ending Spanish colonization for 12 years. Um, <clears throat> with the colonization of the Southwest by the Spanish Empire, 
uh, came the uh, came new institutions uh, such as the encomienda system, which was uh, essentially a system of slavery for Native Americans, where they would be shipped off to plantations like this to be worked and forced to do hard labor. Um, as you can see here, uh, and the idea was generally, uh, you know, the plan was, at least in theory, was Spanish settlers would protect and care for and Christianize the uh, natives, and then the natives would work a portion of their time for Spanish settlers. But of course, the reality was the Spanish settlers would force uh, the natives to work a long labor without pay. They would, of course, not protect the natives. They would also seize native lands. Uh, and many natives would die from disease and harsh living and working condi conditions. Uh, but argu arguably, uh, one of the most impactful, if not the most impactful uh, change that the Spanish uh, colonization of the Southwest uh, caused was the reintroduction of horses into North America. Horses, of course, had been here for uh, been here in North America for thousands of years uh, prior, uh, only going extinct around seven, six to seven thousand years ago, uh, give or take. So very recently. Um, so, but they, of course, had been gone for that long amount of time, but now they were back. Uh, and this uh, reintroduction can be seen at best. Uh, in papers like this paper by uh, William Timothy Trail Taylor uh, et al., which shows the uh, reintroduction of horses into North America um, happened right around the 1600 mark, 1600 CE mark, um, with some horses actually maybe even escaping during the Great Pueblo result uh, only 80 years later. And this would lead to the rapid uh, spread and uh, population growth of horses throughout the Great Basin and the eventually the Great Plains. Um, and it seems, based off of wear, uh, bit wear and things like that on horses from areas uh, like the Great Basin, like Idaho, Wyoming, etc., uh, that had not been colonized by Spain yet, uh, that uh, it seems that based off of this, that uh, the native cultures of the Great Basin and, and eventually the Great Plains uh, pretty quickly took to riding these horses. Um, so um, it was a, re a really quick societal change. Um, uh, after all, I mean, horses provide you know, greater mobility and greater speed and things like that. So why wouldn't you, uh, and, you know, why wouldn't you utilize them? And especially, it's especially easy to see how they uh, would adopt horses so easily because, I mean, they already saw the Spaniards doing it. So it's not like it would take too long to put two and two together. Uh, so eventually this would new, this, this new, um, the, the reintroduction of horses would lead to this cultural change uh, where, uh, as it, based off of that bit where, as we can see, would lead to many, if not all, of the uh, native cultures of the Great Basin and Great Plains shifting to uh, becoming horse-bound warriors and hunters, uh, as you can see here. The Comanches, of course, were no different. And this new horse this new horse technology, this new horse culture that began to develop within the Great Basin and Great Plains tribe uh, eventually allowed the Comanche to break off from their Shoshone, uh, from their Shoshone parent culture and would allow them to break off and eventually migrate into the southern Great Plains of Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, Colorado, and eastern New Mexico. <clears throat> okay, so now that we have taken a look at uh, Great Basin native cultures and uh, 
Comanche and Shoshone cultures uh, before and up to European colonization. Now let's take a look at Comanche society after its development into the horse culture, nomadic horse culture that it became. So first off, there are four levels of social, uh, social political integration in traditional uh, pre-reservation Comanche society. Uh, the first of that being that Comanche society was a patrilineal society based off of uh, descent from a uh, father or through the male line, and they were also patrilocal communities, meaning that when a couple would marry, they would settle in the husband's home or community. Now, if you remember, if, if any of you has, have watched my previous videos uh, on Native American culture, you'll notice that uh, by and large, most Native American cultures in North America were matrilineal and matrilocal communities, meaning that the marriage was, the descent was based off of the uh, father or the female line, and when they married, they would go to the wife's home or community. But with all that being said, it's also important to remember that Native American culture is not a monolith. Uh, there is not one single unified Native American culture for North America. There are thousands of them. So, of course, while most of them would be matrilineal and matrifocal, it stands to reason that there would still be a few uh, that were patrilineal and patrilocal. Uh, so, that's something important to keep in mind. <clears throat> and then the next levels, uh, the more, sort of more um, generalized levels of pre-reservation Comanche society were the extended family group um, called the uh, people who lived together in a household. Um, they had no size limits, <clears throat> uh, but kinship re uh, recognition was limited to relatives two generations above or three below. Then next you had the local band uh, or rancheria, which is a Spanish term, not a uh, native term. Um, which comprised one or more of the uh, extended family groups, uh, one of which formed its core. Uh, the band was the primary social unit of the Comanche. A typical band might number several hundred people. It was a family group centered around a group of men, all of whom were relatives, sons, brothers, or cousins. Um, since marriage with a known relative was forbidden, wives came from another group and sisters left to join their husbands. And then you had the have the division or branch comprising several local groups linked by kinship, uh, as well as uh, uh, subtle, uh, as well as different um, uh, societies uh, based around uh, political uh, medicine or military uh, ideas and needs, uh, as well as other common interests such as hunting, gathering, uh, and war, peace, and trade. So here is a map uh, from 1785, so a little late in Comanche uh, history, uh, but it gives you a general idea of what the divisions and such would have looked like. So you had groups like the Koso, uh, the Kotsoteca, or as or well as the uh, Yupes or Jupes, uh, and then the Yamparica. So each group had its own substantial, each division of uh, Comanche, which again consisted of several different uh, local groups or extended family groups, uh, had their own rather sizable territory, which you can see here. And here's what a Comanche village would have generally looked like. Uh, now it is time to look at the Comanche social and political positions. Uh, so first would be the uh, Namankat, or the leader of any particular group camp, uh, and then you had the uh, para evil, and I apologize, apologies for possibly butchering that, or the chief, uh, who is the central man in a local group. Um, after his death, one of the other men would take his place. If none were available, the band members might drift apart to other groups where they might have relatives or establish new relations by marrying an existing member. There was no separate term or status for uh, peace chief or war chief. Any man leading a war party was a war chief. 
Uh, and then you had the council, which was the governing body of any given village it, that was formed by the adult men of the village, but not all men necessarily participated. Uh, they were led by the para, uh, the uh, para evo, uh, or chief of the village. Uh, the council would bo uh, meet both formally and informally to discuss matters of public concern. Um, councils could also consist of representatives of different bands who met to discuss matters of concern to multiple bands. Uh, and then uh, there's a, an important concept to uh, discuss, uh, medicine power or kuha. Uh, and I apologize to any Comanche uh, members of Comanche Nation who are watching if I butchered that phrase, so I do apologize. But uh, medicine power was a religious practice available to both men and women uh, centered on acquiring medicine power or puha, again, apologies for also butchering that, from supernatural beings. Medicine power resides nearly everywhere, but not in equal amounts. Some sources include the sun, earth, or uh, the father, um, uh, and they have intrinsic power. Uh, peyote and cedar also have intrinsic power, as do animals with the exceptional physical strength or abilities. Um, thus, eagles, bears, coyotes, skunks, bison, wolves, antelopes, and opossums are considered especially endowed with intrinsic power, although any uh, animal conceivably could be a source of this medicine power uh, or puha. Again, apologies for possibly butchering that, uh, but cannot give the same amount. Both sexes could become a possessor of power or a uh, puhawk too. Uh, again, apologies for us butchering that. Uh, power could be attained via vision quest, uh, by transfer, inheritance, purchase, or training. Another way to achieve power is to visit the grave of a uh, puhawk too. Uh, apologies for us butchering that. To seek their personal power. Uh, Sundance leaders also sought visions, particularly when seeking information about the future or lost relatives. Uh, puha, again, for possibly butchering that, uh, puha could also be obtained in dreams. So with this in mind, there were uh, societies in uh, different bands and villages and such known as medicine societies, or which were small groups of men and women who shared the same medicine power or puha. Again, apologies for possibly butchering that. Uh, similarly, um, Men, uh, uh, warriors of, of any given village were only uh, men. So for a man, social status and prestige was uh, acquired through war. Uh, the most valued members of Comanche society were young males who were skilled in war and horsemanship. In camp, they were given comfort and afforded many privileges as it was commonly believed they would die early. The ultimate honor with, uh, was death at the hands of an enemy. Individual warriors desired to distinguish themselves in war and raiding to become a warrior. Um, to be considered a warrior by the community was the ideal. Uh, and a warrior was one who faced the enemy even when dismounted. With that in mind, there were uh, certain societies known as soldier societies, or groups of men whose primary ritual context was a ceremony to recruit volunteers for revenge and war expeditions. Uh, they also uh, sometimes acted in lawmaking and law enforcement capacities, such as enforcing hunting policies, uh, especially later on uh, with, after contact with the United States. Um, you know, because often these hunting policies were involved with trees like the Treaty of Adobe Walls, <clears throat> uh, as well as making sure no warriors broke their promise to go on military expeditions, i.e. if you volunteered to go on one of these expeditions, the soldier societies uh, would be the ones in charge of making sure you get that promise. Examples of these types of societies include, but are not limited to, uh, the Little Pony Society, the Big Horse People, the Black Knife People, and the Wolves. And then to further uh, talk about this idea, there would be the War Party, which was, uh, which were intra and inter band efforts. Uh, war parties were groups of warriors assembled by the Para Evo uh, chief. Uh, with the goal of going on military expeditions.
Uh, now, let's take a look at some Comanche status symbols. So, there were a variety of status symbols that a Comanche uh, Parivo uh, or warrior uh, could have. Uh, there were uh, these long, crooked club whip-like things, uh, uh, oftentimes called crooked clubs or crooked whips, uh, called uh, pian u, uh, yeah, pian u pi, uh, that you can see here, and they were status symbols for a variety of different um, chiefs and warriors uh, well into the 1930s. In fact, here is a picture of a Comanche individual known as Shavato uh, with his uh, pian u pu i. Apologies for butchering that possibly. Uh, other status symbols could also include um, very ornately decorated spears, often decorated uh, with rings of crow feathers, or perhaps wrapped in beaver pelt. Uh, with that in mind, there are also beaver felt caps, like you see here. Uh, also, there were uh, buffalo headdresses, uh, as well as war bonnets that were decorated with eagle feathers, which was an, an immense honor. And it's important to remember that all of these things that I'm mentioning are things that you, one would only obtain after meeting certain parameters and meeting certain honors and things like that. They were not something that would be worn by everyone in a Comanche society. So as, it, as Halloween is approaching, please remember, war bonnets and headdresses were not... Um, are not costumes. They are very important religious and ceremonial symbols of the uh, peoples of the Great Plains. <laughs> now, with that in mind, let's take a look at what Comanche warfare looked like. So Comanche warfare took the form of raiding to acquire wealth and prestige, as well as uh, the to gather uh, wealth to be re redistributed uh, to kin members as well as non-kin uh, kin members, uh, in order to gain, gain in, in order to gain political power and supporters, uh, warfare was not uh, done for conquest or things like that. Uh, men often took risks, uh, seeking glory and status. Horse stealing and revenge were common reasons for conducting a raid to take uh, plunder, uh, captives, and war trophies. Any man could or organize a raid, but usually he had to have a reputation to gather a sufficient following. Uh, the raid leader had absolute authority during the raid. Uh, the raid spoils belonged to the raid leader who would be expected to divide the plunder to demonstrate his generosity and enhance his reputation. Uh, warfare among the Comanche involved coordinated attacks uh, similar to all Great Plains tribes. Uh, warfare was conducted to acquire new territory and resources, as well as to, uh, to defend assets against invasion. Uh, important to remember, acquire new territory was really just to uh, control hunting lanes and hunting territories. It was not for out quite, uh, outright conquest. Um, that was not a uh, that was not a very common thing in Native American warfare. Uh, Native American warfare involved, you know, prestige and the control of hunting uh, areas, of hunting grounds. Yeah. With that in mind, uh, the mo one of the most common customs involving Great Plains warfare was counting coup, and this, of course, included the Comanche. So counting coup was a custom common to all Plains natives in which the object was to simply touch an enemy in battle without hurting them. A special coup stick was sometimes used for this purpose, although a war club, uh, a lance, a bow, or even a hand itself would do. Uh, an eagle feather was then awarded to the warrior for each coup. If after counting coup on an armed enemy, he managed to kill him, then scalp him, a warrior would receive three coup feathers. Uh, but of course, that was not the main goal. Uh, as I mentioned just a couple of seconds ago, uh, capturing an enemy's possessions, especially their own eagle feathers, brought great honor. So here is a diagram of sort of the different types of feathers one might receive after counting coup. Uh, and here is one another diagram of that as well. 
Now, with that in mind, let's look at early Comanche contact uh, and trade with Spanish New Mexico and Texas. So, the earliest references to the Comanche in New Mexico come from 1706 CE, uh, where they mention Comanche and Ute uh, trading parties coming to various different pueblos in New Mexico. Um, but the descriptions mention the descriptions that mention these the Comanche and the Utes uh, also talk about describe them as if they should already be known about. In other words, like they've already been there for a while. So many uh, historians and academics uh, assume that the Comanche had actually been here a little bit earlier, like in the, say, the 1680s or the 1690s CE, uh, though their territory was not quite as large as we eventually get, uh, probably just in the northwestern part uh, around what is New Mexico and uh, northwestern Texas and such. Uh, with and Once they got to this region during the 1680s and 90s, uh, in 1706, um, the first and foremost goal of the Comanche and their allies, the Utes, would ap appear to be trade, uh, with Taos Pueblo in New Mexico becoming a center for trade with the Comanche. Uh, and here's a map of the sort of trade routes that the Comanche would have, uh, starting with Taos and eventually making its way out uh, across North America, which we'll get to a little bit later in the video. Uh, and Comanche trade goods uh, would consist of items uh, such as uh, buffalo pelts, uh, as well as they would trade horses. Uh, and also, to be fair, they would also trade enemy captives as well. Um, and in return for these goods, buffalo pelts, horses, um, captives of enemy tribes uh, for the Encomienda system, European trade goods would be given to the Comanche in return. Uh, these would include things like trade knives, you know, steel knives, um, muskets, uh, as well as metal cooking utensils, such as uh, these uh, cast iron pots, as well as kitchen utensils. They would also, uh, the Europeans and the Spanish, uh, and eventually the French, would also trade to the Comanche in return for these uh, pelts, uh, horses, and captives for the incoming into system, they would trade to them candy. Uh, in fact, there are descriptions from uh, the 1780s uh, where uh, during these sort of trade fairs, these, these trading events between the Comanche and the Spanish, uh, where some of the trade goods mentioned were European candies that were given to the Comanche. And these can include things uh, such as various types of chocolates, um, as well as Turkish delights, among others. Uh, it would also be during this early this time period, uh, the 1690s and the 17 early 1700s, that the Comanche would form an alliance with the powerful Ute tribe, uh, located in the Great Basin region of uh, Colorado and, uh, and Wyoming and such. Uh, though it's also important to note that during this early contact with Europeans, uh, smallpox would begin to kill many Plains natives, including the Comanche. And here's a picture of a uh, smallpox epidemic here. Now it is time to move on to the bulk of the video. Uh, the Spanish-Comanche Wars, which lasted from 1716 to 1786 CE. Now, it's important to note the earlier videos in my series on this um, in the series on uh, the earliest large-scale uh, conflicts between Native American nations and European colonial powers. Uh, all of those videos were set during the 1600s, with the latest originally being the Beaver Wars, which ended in like the 1710s. So I am stretching this a little bit as this goes from the early 1700s to well into the 1780s, uh, which is uh, well past the other conflicts in this series. But as this 
uh, started very early in the 1700s uh, and was the only the second large conflict between the Spanish and the Native Americans of the American Southwest. Um, it is important to include this in this in the series because again, it is only, it is after all only the second large scale conflict that the Spanish faced with Native Americans in the North American Southwest. <laughs> all right, so the Comanche, the Spanish Comanche Wars began in 1716 CE when uh, uh, the Spanish governor of New Mexico, uh, believing that the Comanches and Utes were spying on Spanish towns to learn about their weaknesses, launched an attack on a peaceful Ute Comanche camp near San Antonio Mountain, uh, killing and capturing many and, of course, enslaving the captives. And here's what a, a camp would look like, and here are what the scene of the Comanche and Ute captives being enslaved and taken were. Uh, after this incident uh, at San Antonio Mountain, conflict between the Spanish and the Ute Com and Comanches would become much more violent, and in 1719 CE, the Ute and Comanche carried out a large raid on the Taos area, killing uh, several people. Uh, and here's a Comanche war party, uh, and there is the Taos area over here. All right, so now that the Comanche, Spanish Comanche Wars have begun, let's take a look at the you know, different uh, military groups of each side and what types of weapons they used during this period of time. So with that in mind, let's take a look at the Comanche warriors and their weapons in the 1700s and early 1800s. So the Comanche during this period of time, uh, Comanche warriors during this period of time, generally looked something like this. And this is uh, s sort of how a lot of Plains warriors would have looked. Um, they would have had um, wood or uh, buffalo bone armor, um, and it would have looked something like this, and of course it would have been horse-bound and had uh, wooden shields and such. And the types of weapons they used included, but were not limited to, uh, spears, like you see this one here, as well as the very famous Comanche bows, which were known for being as being very accurate uh, and very deadly. Uh, for up close combat, the Comanche would use things uh, such as uh, various different types of war clubs and tomahawks, such as this one you see here or here, as well as new uh, types of tomahawk uh, called pipe tomahawks, uh, like this one you see here that were made of steel. The other ones were originally made of stone. Uh, and of course, having obtained items through trade, uh, the Comanche would also utilize metal knives, uh, you know, originally trade knives repurposed for warfare and raiding and hunting. Uh, they would also utilize to varying degrees European muskets that they obtained via trade with Spain and France eventually. Uh, and at least one Comanche Paraivo uh, chief is known to have used a saber that he obtained via trade in combat. Now, let's take a look at the Spanish soldiers and weapons in of the 1700s. So during the 1700s and 1800s, the Spanish soldiers of uh, New Mexico, Spain, and Mexico generally looked something like this, with an infantryman sort of generally looking something like this, uh, wearing this type of uniform, occasionally sporting a small shield, and of course utilizing um, uniforms and hats such as this. Uh, and then this is generally what cavalrymen of the uh, Spanish New Mexico, Texas, and Mexico would have looked like. Uh, as you can see, they are starkly different from the conquistador that was characteristic of the 1600s and, and 1500s. And, of course, many of us, as many of us already know, the Spanish would utilize weapons such as the saber and, of course, would utilize various different types of daggers in combat. Uh, a common sidearm would be a pistol. And, of course, the primary um, weapon used by uh, Spanish soldiers would be a musket, as seen here. 
Uh, and cavalrymen would generally use uh, pistols and long lances, spears, or pikes like you see here. All right, so now let's go back to the uh, bulk of the Comanche, the Spanish Comanche Wars. So after the Comanche raids on the Taos area, uh, Taos Pueblo area in 1719 CE, uh, the Spanish governor of New Mexico would organize an expedition to punish, uh, quote unquote, punish the Comanches and Utes, um, gathering a an army of more than 700 soldiers, most consisting mostly of Pueblo and Apache auxiliaries. Um, However, the force, uh, after the force marched into the Arkansas River, they would search for two months and not find a single Ute or Comanche um, individual or warband at all. So essentially, it was a pointless affair. Uh, during the, and because of that, during this period of time, the Comanche would continue to push uh, south into the southern plains. Uh, continuing to apply pressure and push the uh, various different Apache uh, tribes and groups off the Great Plains and, of course, would continue to expand southward into areas like Texas and eventually Mexico. Uh, the Comanche, however, would also slowly grow apart from their allies, both culturally and politically, uh, in the 1730s CE. Uh, and in 1749 CE, the Utes would ask uh, the Spanish in New Mexico for military assistance against the Comanche, um, leading to a war between the Ute and, and Comanche that would continue for the remainder of the 18th century. However, the Comanche would oftentimes view the Ute as sort of a secondary priority, uh, with other priorities being uh, the Spanish and other rival tribes. Uh, the Comanche, despite the, uh, several small military defeats and reverses, would begin to dominate the colony of New Mexico, as you can see here in this map, as they begin to explain, expand into the New Mexico territory, um, raiding and trading alternatively, uh, alternately throughout the 1740s CE. There are some Comanche horsemen uh, going on what would be a raid or a hunting expedition. Uh, a, in, with that in mind, uh, in 1747 CE, a Spanish Puebloan force of around 500 men would attack a Comanche and Ute camp near the Chama River, killing around 107 of the natives and capturing 206. Here is a uh, Spanish soldier. Uh, here is the Chama River. Um, and then in 1751 CE, Spanish and Puebloan troops would trap 300 Comanche in a box canyon, uh, killing 112 and capturing 33. Uh, However, uh, in Texas, uh, the Comanche would ally themselves with a group of tribes, uh, the Spanish called the Norteños, uh, or the Northerners. Um, uh, be named that because uh, uh, they uh, resided uh, north uh, of the Spanish settlements. Uh, I just want to pause <laughs> to, to, to point out that I accidentally wrote that as source. Uh, instead of north. Um, anyways, uh, but north of the Spanish settlements, uh, <clears throat> the Norteños uh, consisted of uh, the Wichita, especially the sub-tribe of the uh, Tao, uh, the, and I may butcher this and I apologize, Ta, uh, Tao Vias, uh, who had moved southward to the Red River Valley of Oklahoma and Texas in ar around 1750 CE, uh, the Tonkawa of the Texas Plains, the uh, Hasi, uh, yeah, the Hasanais, again, apologies for possibly butchering that, uh, who were the westernmost of the Caddo people um, who lived in this area around 1750 CE as well. Meanwhile, in New Mexico, the defeats uh, of 1747 and 1751 would cause the Comanche to sue for peace. 
uh, the peace agreement agreement would actually be very favorable for the Comanche, granting them trade privileges uh, and treatment as a sovereign nation, um, which would then free them to make war on the Utes. Because again, remember, the Utes, while they were at war with the Comanches, the Comanches viewed the Utes as a secondary concern rather than a primary concern. So now that their primary concern was, uh, at least for now, resolved, they could turn their attention to the secondary concern, that being the Utes. Uh, however, uh, again, in contrast, uh, in 1758 CE, a large band of Norteños, including the Comanches, would sack the San Saba mission, a mission established to advance uh, northward from San Antonio to make uh, Christians of the Lapan Apache. In retaliation for this, uh, a Spanish and Indian uh, and a native army of more than five hundred men would be uh, <clears throat> would be gathered uh, to attempt to get revenge for San Saba uh, and would attack uh, two large fortified Talavaya villages in the Red River, uh, River Valley near uh, Spanish Fort Texas, uh, but. This would be a disaster for the Spanish native force uh, as they would be defeated in the Battle of the Twin Villages by the Tal Laya and the Comanche uh, in 1759 CE. And here's a picture of what the a, uh, Tal Laya, Wichita village, uh, like the Twin Villages would have looked like. Uh, after a minor dispute, uh, the Spanish would then join the Utes to attack a Comanche encampment, uh, killing more than 400 and capturing 300 in New Mexico. Uh, the resultant, uh, there, there, this would eventually result in a peace agreement that again is favorable to the Comanche, uh, granting them status as allies rather than enemies of the Spanish in New Mexico. Uh, this would happen between 1761 and 1762 CE. Um, and here's a, another Comanche village here. Uh, however, um, the 1762 peace agreement would eventually break down and the Comanche would embark on an intense campaign, which over several years would kill hundreds of Spanish and Puebloans and would leave the Rio Grande Valley of New Mexico in ruins. Uh, this would happen all through the 1760s, culminating in 1767 CE, um, the Comanche uh, essentially gaining the upper hand against New Mexico. Though this would not be met without some setbacks, this Comanche, uh, the gaining of this Comanche gaining of the upper hand over New Mexico would not be met without some setbacks, as one of their most important uh, leaders. Uh, the uh, Comanche uh, Paraibo, um, uh, known as Dangerous Man, uh, also known as Cuerno Verde or Greenhorn, uh, would lead a war party against uh, the Spanish at Ojo Caliente in New Mexico, uh, only to be killed in combat. Uh, the records state that uh, a one Spanish soldier was able to get a shot off and uh, fatally wound uh, Cuerno Verde uh, that you see here. <clears throat> uh, furthermore, as uh, in Texas, as the Wichitas are severely weakened by outbreaks of European diseases, the Comanche-Wichita alliance would all begin to fall apart. Um, but the Comanches would also begin to move eastward towards the Brazos River and would begin to trade directly with the Spanish and French population of Louisiana. Before then, the Wichita had been sort of their middlemen. Meanwhile, the Spanish in Texas are also menaced by the powerful Osage tribe on its northern front frontier and Apache raids south of the Rio Grande River in New Mexico, and they would begin to seek peace with the Comanche uh, throughout the 1770s CE. Uh, and here is the Wichita here. Um, uh, here are the Osage a little bit north of there, and here are the various uh, Apache groups, the uh, La Pan, the Mescalero, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to the south here. And then here is Spanish Louisiana, 
uh, that would only remain a Spanish possession until around the 1800s. However, uh, these peace talks uh, would fall apart uh, as 600 soldiers would surround a band of Comanches uh, and kill 300 men, women, and children and take more than uh, 100 prisoners. Uh, being taken prisoner by the Spanish usually me meant to transport to the mines of Mexico or sugar plantations of the Caribbean uh, for men and slavery in Spanish households for women and children. Um, though undeterred by these occasional defeats, the Comanche would continue to strengthen their economic and political hold on New Mexico and Texas as well, but mainly during this period they would be increasing their hold on New Mexico. And so here's a map showing that, showing the increasing uh, Comanche um, hegemony over the uh, eastern New Mexico. And then here is a picture of what uh, the sort of brutal life one might be expecting uh, and brutal treatment one might, one might expect, or what one definitely expect, sorry, uh, at Spanish plantations uh, or mines or in Comandas. Uh, in 1778 CE, uh, the massacre of a Comanche peace delegation in eastern Texas would ignite the most serious Comanche attacks on Spanish uh, Spanish settlements um, uh, and other and other native tribes seen yet in Texas. Uh, the Spanish, uh, who had dreamt of a powerful colony in Texas to counter the advance of British and French colonists, uh, would see their hopes dashed as Spanish came under, he Spanish Texas came under heavy assault by the Comanche. Uh, and you can see that here in this map as the Comanche would penetrate deep into Texas and then also would penetrate deep into Spanish Mexico, um, uh, causing a lot of uh, devastation and uh, would really do a lot of damage to the Spanish uh, control of the area. And here is a map of sort of the area that the Comanche were attacking in uh, Spanish Mexico, uh, which included things like missions, uh, presidios, uh, villages, and roads, and, thing, and things like that. Uh, meanwhile, back in New Mexico, in 1779 CE, uh, the, gov the current governor of New Mexico, Juan Batista de Anza, uh, an experienced, quote-unquote, Indian fighter uh, would t decide to take uh, the war to the Comanche in their own country. Uh, with 800 men, including 200 Utes and, a and Apache auxiliaries, he would march north and would eventually kill the second Cuerno Verde, Greenhorn, possibly the son of the original, but that's still up for debate, uh, who was the most important Comanche war leader as well as many of his followers in the Greenhorn Valley of uh, South Pueblo, Colorado. After the, uh, after the death of the second Cuerno Verde, uh, raids would drop off noticeably, but did not halt entirely. Uh, meanwhile, uh, across the plains, a smallpox ep epidemic would reduce the native population, including the Comanche. The epidemic, plus the realization by both the Spanish and the Comanche that they had other interests and enemies, would lead to moves uh, towards peace by both parties. So here is again a, a depiction of a smallpox outbreak, uh, and here's a graph showing just how stark that population decline due to the epidemic was. So in 1778, the population, overall population of uh, the Comanches was around the 17,000 to 18,000 mark. Uh, but after the um, smallpox ep epidemics throughout the 1780s, uh, 1779 through 1781, uh, the population of the Comanche would decline to only around 13,000. Now, this was still a sizable population, but that's still, you know, a death rate of 5,000 people um, of the Comanche population. So again, going down from 18,000 to 13,000. So a very steep drop in population, even if the Comanche still had a sizable population 
uh, afterwards, um, it's still devastating. So with that in mind, starting in Texas, uh, the Wichita would sort of uh, broker a peace uh, between Spain, um, leading it to Spain with the help of the Wichita, uh, sending individuals such as Pedro Vial and Comanche speaking Francisco Xavier Chavez to negotiate an agreement with the Eastern Comanche. Uh, which included the distribution of large gifts to the Comanche and the return by the Comanches of all Spanish prisoners that they held captive, um, ending hostilities between the Comanche and Spanish in Texas uh, in, 17, in 1785 CE. So, uh, right after that, and possibly taking uh, the inspiration from the uh, earlier piece between the Comanches and Spanish Texas, De Anza would then let it be known that he was interested in making peace with the Comanches if they could agree on a single leader to represent them. Uh, various sub-tribes of the Comanche, uh, such as the uh, Kotzoteca, the Yupe, and the uh, Yamaparica, uh, would give power to make peace to a leader named uh, Equera Capa, uh, uh, apologies for possibly butchering that. Uh, and after two meetings at Pecos and another at a Comanche camp, uh, De Anza would send a signed treaty to Mexico City. Uh, and then De Anza would also arrange for a truce between the Utes and the Comanches while gaining a Comanche alliance with the Spanish against the Apache. In fact, it's very probable that this was the main reason that De Anza wanted to make peace with the Comanches um, because he realized how powerful the Comanches were and how useful that power could be against other enemy tribes, such as the Apache. <clears throat> uh, many of which were, many of which the many groups of the Apache were, of course, hostile to the Spanish. And with that, the agreement ended major hostilities between the Comanche and, and Spanish and Puebloans of New Mexico, um, specifically ending in July 1786 CE. Now, of course, this didn't, doesn't mean there weren't smaller raids happening in Mexico and Texas, but large-scale hostilities had ended. So here is a uh, our uh, sketches of some of the uh, uh, individuals who were at these peace talks between De Anza uh, and the Comanche divisions, uh, Western Comanche divisions. And then here is a picture of New of Mexico City uh, during the 1780s. All right, so now that the war had ended, uh, the, 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 this, large, uh, this long period of several wars actually had ended, let's take a look at the aftermath. Well, first things first, uh, Listen, uh, one of the most immediate uh, aftermaths of these peace of the peace between uh, the Spanish and the Comanches was the 1786 joint Comanche Spanish expedition against the Apache. And here is a sheet by Governor Anza uh, showing the Comanche military formations. Um, and the uh, Comanche played a major, uh, a very large part in this uh, expedition. And you can see sort of the summary of that here in this paper by Alfred Thomas from the uh, 1929, uh, tw uh, I believe, uh, titled An 18th Century Comanche Document. Uh, and looking at uh, the, essentially the roll records, you know, the, the volunteer records, um, you know, the makeup of the military uh, or the raiding parties of this expedition, uh, we see that the Comanche provided a total of uh, 593 warriors to this expedition alone. So a really sizable uh, force. Um, and this is really important because it shows just how powerful the Comanche were uh, and just how many warriors they could just one division uh, could could provide to any given war effort. And of course, this expedition was successful, or at least was viewed as a success by the Spanish and the Comanche. Um, one other interesting thing about this is for a little bit, uh, it looked like maybe this piece might uh, fall apart. 
Uh, and Danza talks about how he was terrified of this happening just because of how many warriors uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, Equercapa uh, could uh, alone could muster. Um, because again, if you remember all of the expeditions that the Spanish mounted, the largest expedition that um, the Spanish ever mounted against the Comanches was only around uh, 800 to 1,000 people. Uh, Ecuador Capa, one division uh, could for could uh, field a, a force of uh, comparable power, uh, especially comparable to earlier Spanish expeditions that had around 500 to 600 individuals, uh, filling a force of around 593. And that was just one division. Now imagine if Equerocapa had made an alliances with other divisions as well. So it's <clears throat> it was very fortunate for the Spanish that the Comanche uh, Spanish peace did not fall apart. Um, and I think that's important to remember that uh, it was never any it, <clears throat> it was never necessarily clear. It was never you know peace the peace was never necessarily going to stay together and if it did if it didn't it was going to be a very bad thing for the spanish uh, and here's some more of those muster rolls here uh after this signing of the peace and after the command the successful uh joint Comanche uh, Spanish expedition against the Apache, uh, the Comanche territory known as Comancheria would largely reach the shape it would hold until the 1850s. Um, and here is it here during 1785, and here is it here from roughly 1850. <clears throat> uh, furthermore, after this peace was signed, the Spanish would shower the Comanche with gifts, and then would remove trade restrictions on guns and ammunition, uh, which would then allow a new class of traders called Comancheros to transport Spanish goods into the Comanche heartland uh, in the Texas panhandle and would trade for uh, buffalo robes, meat, and horses. And here, <clears throat> and here are some Comancheros here. Furthermore, because they had uh, successfully uh, negotiated for uh, peace in the end of major, again, major, there's, there were still minor raids going on, but the end of major hostilities between the Comanches and the Spanish Empire, uh, Spain would then be able to hold on to the American Southwest for 35 more years until the 1820s when Mexico would rebel and uh, overthrow Spanish rule in the region and would establish the um, uh, United Mexican States and eventually the Mexican Empire. <laughs> all right, so now with all of that out of the way, with the aftermath of uh, the Comanche Wars taken a look at, let's take a look at where the Native Americans mentioned in this video are today. So first off, uh, the Comanche uh, are still a recognizable political entity known as the Comanche Nation. Uh, unfortunately for them, uh, they were, after a series of uh, defeats at the hands of the United States, uh, the Comanche would be gradually uh, forcibly removed to Oklahoma, where they now reside in this area here. However, despite this, uh, the, the U.S. colonization and the U.S. cultural and um, physical genocide of the Comanche, uh, the Comanche still hold on to their religious culture uh, and their culture in general. Um, it is still alive and well, um, and they are very proud of it, as they should be. <laughs> uh, similarly, the Ute today also still exist as a uh, political entity um, known as the uh, uh, Southern Ute Indian Tribe, uh, and they reside in uh, several reservations uh, in uh, what is now uh, Utah. And again, uh, like the Comanche, despite the colonization and genocide, both physical and cultural, at the hands of the United States, 
uh, the Utes still hold on to their culture, both religious and um, everyday culture, as you can see here. Uh, then there comes the Wichita, uh, which again still survives as a recognizable nation, political entity, uh, and again, much like the uh, Comanche, um, and of course the Utes, the Wichita suffered greatly at the hands of United States colonization, uh, where again they were slowly but surely forcibly removed to what is now part of Oklahoma, where they reside in this region here, with the Cotto and the Lenape, also known as the Delaware. But again, they, despite the best attempts of the United States uh, and Spain, to be fair, um, the uh, Wichita still hold on to their culture uh, and religious practices, as you can see in these pictures here. All right, so with that, uh, that ends our video. And that ends our series on the earliest uh, large-scale conflicts between Native Americans and European colonial powers. Uh, and of course, that does not end our series uh, on uh, early colonial debacles that disprove the inherent myth of uh, European superiority, because there are quite a few um, so uh, events that fit that description. So with that, we have seen how, uh, despite this idea that Euro European powers quickly went out and wholesale conquered uh, the Americas, um, despite that idea, the reality was quite different. Uh, European powers were often, um, often, at least at first, out of their depth. I mean, take a look at Spain. Spain suffered great, despite their continued attempts to uh, march into Comanche territory and, you know, several victories. They did gain several victories against the Comanche. But for every victory in a, uh, that they gained against the Comanche and for every attempt to uh, permanently end the Comanche threat, uh, the Spanish also faced heavy raids and heavy defeats at the hands of the Comanche as well. Uh, with Texas uh, suffering to a lot more than New Mexico, New Mexico fared a little bit better, but even then, New Mexico still was only able to end uh, the uh, large-scale conflicts between the Comanche and uh, the Spanish Empire by essentially paying the Comanche to uh, focus their attentions on uh, other enemy tribes, such as the Apache. And even then, uh, as I brought as I brought up in that section about the joint Apache, uh, sorry, joint Comanche Spanish attack on the Apache, even then the fear that the Comanche would uh, essentially uh, uh, um, betray the command uh, the uh, Spanish and gather a large force to attack them was ever present because the Comanche were still a force to be reckoned with. So what that shows and what all the other videos show is that um, when European powers were by no means guaranteed to win, uh, it shows that Native American nations were every bit the equal militarily and politically to European nations, um, and it shows how uh, uh, how fluid uh, early uh, early colonial America was in terms of uh, political divisions and geographic divisions uh, and even cultural divisions. So with that, I will end this series. I hope all of you enjoyed this video. Um, and if you want to see me cover any of the subjects I mentioned in the video in greater detail and other videos, feel free to leave a comment in the comment section. And I hope you all enjoyed the series. If any of you have any other ideas for uh, ideas for any other uh, series uh, that you want me to cover uh, in other videos, also leave a comment in the comment section. Um, and remember to like, share, and subscribe. And I hope you all have a good day.